All right. Today on the show, we have Deanna Corey from the Deanna Corey team in New York, uh, also part of the Corcoran Group. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Deanna. Now, Deanna Corey has distinguished herself as one of Manhattan's top brokers by all measures and continuously ranks among the top five agents in sales volume within the Corcoran Group year over year. Now, with over 36 years of experience in the industry. She has built a reputation as a hardworking broker with a great intellect, knowledge, sensitivity, and expertise, and has built and leads an incredible team of esteemed professionals. Deanna has sold, and this is amazing, well over 2 billion of residential real estate in Manhattan. Oh yeah. And in only in the last decade, which is beyond incredible. And her team has a unified and strong presence throughout the city. Now a testament to Deanna's marketing success is the sheer variety and depth of her transactions. Deanna has marketed and sold apartments and townhomes of all varieties and has headed up several sales teams in major new developments, including one $300 million project where she was responsible for over a hundred million in sales within nine months. She is lauded in the industry and, and by her loyal clientele for her brilliance in marketing and negotiating and is highly sought after for her perspective on the state of the market. Deanna stands out in the industry as a pioneer in staging properties for resale and has a keen knowledge of what it takes to create a visually appealing space by improving or even redesigning what exists in order to increase the market value of a property. Um, please, everyone, visit Deanna's website, which is DeannaCorey.com. I'm going to spell that D E A N N A and K A, sorry, K O R Y. I'm going to give it one more time D E A N N A K O R Y dot com. And Deanna, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here. I am excited to have <laughs> you. And since I just gave your website, before we get started, I wanted to okay. point something out that I, after gosh, I think 350 episodes over five years. I don't think I've seen before. I really encourage everyone to visit the website. By the way, the website link is in our show notes. So you can, you can see that if you're listening through a podcast app. The reason I'm going to direct you to her site, other than aside from it, it just being a great website, is what she did specifically, what we call above the fold. And what above the fold means is really when someone first visits a website, the initial sort of screen that they see without having to scroll, like what's the first impression? And what she did, I have never seen before, quite frankly, and among all the guests I've had. If we think about oftentimes what realtors do for their website is they often have, you know, there may be some may, major sort of splash image, or maybe more, maybe even more, um, uh, more commonly, you'll see a search engine like, "Hey, you want to look for properties?" Here's Dana didn't do that, and instead, her above the fold content, and there is a lot of it, but it's really well sort of um, positioned and 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 decorated, um, is different pieces of content that buyers and sellers would actually want to see. So I think that's really interesting because it sets you apart, uh, Deanna, from all lots of other competitors. And I know that was really intentional for you. And before we get into your story, can you just talk <laughs> a little bit about the website? Because it yeah. is so cool. Yeah. Well, my, you know, part of everything I've done when it comes to marketing is to provide information to people. I really believe strongly that we're there not just to sell homes, we're there to educate people because education is the key to people understanding what they're purchasing, what they're selling, and in order to get the best possible deal, both as a seller and as a buyer. So I'm always looking to educate people and that's really what this website is all about. It's not just about promoting the properties, although it is as well, but it's about providing information. So we created it not from a textbook, not from someone who we went to who does hundreds of websites, but we created it independently to reflect that sort of site so that people can come there and learn everything they need to know about buying, about selling, and even more. We do a lot of work with architectural histories and histories of neighborhoods and all sorts of things. So um, I, I, I encourage you to, see, to go to it and uh, explore it. It's a great place for broke realtors to see 
maybe a different way. And it's very elegant. It, it, the way okay. it's laid out is, is, is very, um, it's very readable. Um, and it's cool how you were able to put as much content as you have right there. When I first hit the website, I was like, Oh, I, I don't, I never need to scroll. Not that I, I would scroll anyway, but I didn't have to, to get to the content, <laughs> which, which I think is oftentimes agents don't think about as much. Um, so I, I appreciate that. I also should mention, um, and not just because it's women's history month here in March, mm -hmm. because that's, that's not the reason to bring this up, but it is something to mention that while Deanna has, has a wonderful team and she has both men and women on her team, all of her agents are uh, currently are women. And so she has this wonderful, uh, group of, of women. Um, so we, we honor that, uh, you know, specifically in this month, but we, I always think that is so cool when, uh, when I see a, a you know all women's based uh, you know group um, of agents because it's it's not that common and I just yeah. think it is it's really really cool that you do that. Yeah, um, uh, well, let's talk about how you know going back now I guess thirty six years or so um, we'd love to hear about you know why you got into real estate and and how. Yeah, well, again, uh, sort of honoring Women's History Month, and it, this story is really apropos. So my um, growing up, my my grandmother. Um, who came over from Romania to Calgary, Canada, followed in her brother's footsteps, who came to Chicago, no less, your hometown. Yeah. And um, they were in the business of real estate, as it so happens. So she ended up going to Chicago and joining the firm. And within one year, she tells the story, she was the top salesperson. She walked into the room, there's this very long table with all the salespeople, and they were honoring her. And she didn't want to have any part of it. She was ready to go out and sell again. <laughs> and she, she was very, very, you know, business oriented, very dedicated, very competitive. And so she was the top salesperson within a year of, of joining that firm. And then she eventually started her own firm. And she was responsible for originally developing part of the north side of Chicago. And then subsequently, or during that time, she also started to um, develop an all women's golf course with Joe Nevada, if you know that name, which was a golf pro. Sure. And um then, of course, the Depression struck, and she held a lot of mortgages on buildings all across Chicago, and um, every, she fled, like everybody did. I mean, you know, business was over, and she went to Hollywood and rented movie stars' homes, and then eventually ended up in Miami. But for years when I was growing up, she would go back to Chicago to sign quick claim deeds for people who were selling sure. land and, and collect money. But anyway, so she was my inspiration, actually, for getting into real estate, and because um, I knew that if she could make it in the 1920s in Chicago as a woman, as a woman, um, as amazing. a woman, yeah, yeah, she was in the, all the papers. She was in the Christian Science Monitor, whatever Chicago paper. And she you knew Amelia Earhart. She was very, very big for about a probably about a seven to 10 year period um, before the Depression. And then she just got really, you know, she she had her fame and she went on and, and didn't and went into oblivion relative to what she was doing back then. But I admired her so much for doing what she did. And, um, it, you know, and then I, she en ended up in Miami and investing in real estate. And we ended up having family in Miami and real estate. And all of that inspired me. So I, um, when I, I was a classical musician, of all things. And I, um, yeah. I, <laughs> and what I what to, instrument did you play? I was a bassoonist, don't ask. <laughs> wow, you're like the only bassoonist I've ever met. <laughs> yeah, I was a musician. I went to conservatory in Ohio and I um, decided uh, when I was, I, I actually studied with my idol in the Philadelphia Orchestra and I decided that I was not going to be a professional musician. So I went to New York where I could be in the classical music business because it's the only place you can sure. work in the classical music business. Sure. Yeah. So I was there for four years making next to nothing. I think I was the lowest paid person that I knew, <laughs> but I tried because I did love music. And I just decided I need to be in business on my own. So I applied to business school. I applied to Columbia. I applied to NYU, got into both, got a scholarship to NYU and was going to go to NYU. And I decided that summer, which was this June 37 years ago, that I would try real estate. Wow. So I tried real estate and I said, wait, so I want to, I want to back up for a second. I just want to pause. So you had, did I hear you correctly? Cause I'm feeling like I must not have, because did you say you had a scholarship to NYU I had a that you were like, no, thanks. School. I'm going to go into real estate. <laughs> well, I, I was going to go, I was planning on going, but I, I thought, you know what? It's June. Let me get into real estate and you know, let me see how I do. <laughs> and 
and um, within a month, I was just, I was a bug. It was like a bug because I sold my first apartment and I really wanted to make 100,000 my first year. This was in 1985. That's a and, ton of money in 1985. Oh my God. And, you know, and, and, and remind you, you know, I don't know what properties cost in, in um, Chicago, but back then the studio, you know, in a new beginner would probably sell a studio. Maybe it would cost 20, maybe it would cost $30,000. I mean, we didn't have... Uh, MLS systems, it was all 6% commission, but still it's like 20 or $30,000. I had a goal to make $100,000 my first year. It's a lot of sales. Yeah. yeah and I ended up making 90,000, not too bad. And I never looked back. I never ended up in business school. And here I am, you know, whatever, you know, how many years later? So, um, you know, well, I'll, I'll have to, I'll have to tell my sister because she, uh, she didn't do NYU for undergrad. Um, we actually both went to Miami university in Ohio, but she ended up at Stern, uh, NYU business school. And, yeah. um, she did not get a scholarship to go to business school. And thankfully she got very lucky though, right out of college, she was working for, for L'Oreal at the time. Um, and which is funny because both of our last names are Paris. Um, we are not French and we have nothing to do with L'Oreal Paris, but that just happened to be where she worked. And L'Oreal was was kind enough to actually pay her entire uh, way through Stern. So, um, so, so otherwise it would have been very ugly for her right after, but that allowed her to be able to go out and buy a place in Manhattan, which is, which oh, is wow. obviously not an easy thing to do today. But so, so you, 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 uh, you may had this goal to in 1985 to sort of sell a uh, hundred thousand dollars in, in net income, which is, which is a difficult thing for anybody in their first year. Yes. Yeah, no, no, I obviously was a, I mean, I just had a talent for it, obviously, and maybe because of growing up around it and all of that. Um, and I loved it. And what I ended up doing is I really love people <laughs> and I love helping people. So that, I mean, I do love apartments too, but my goal really is to help people. And, you know, I, I went to Oberlin, which is in Ohio as well. Sure. And if you know anything about Oberlin, like about 5% of the Oberlin population goes into business. So You're right, right. It's, it's not really a business school. Yeah. <laughs> we are not, it, it's all not for profit. Everything arts, else, arts, yeah. Right, everything yeah. else. I mean, yes, a lot of people become lawyers, doctors, you know, mm. that kind of thing. And some go to business. It's a great school. Yeah. Yeah, it is. But I think it was like 10%, whatever. It was a small percentage. So I always felt very guilty for going and selling real estate because that's like a real business and it's like a, it's a, it's a rich person's thing. But I decided that um, the only way I could live with myself doing this is to really do it to help other people and to make their process as easy as possible and to educate them. So this was the way I started my business. And I just decided that's how it was going to be. If I, I knew that if I thought, if I have the, I, I didn't mind having a goal, I want to make X amount of dollars. I put that out there and then I forgot about it. I really wanted to see how I could help people make a decision, find something they love, be happy with what they bought and help them sell when it was time to sell. So that was my goal. That's, that's the whole thing behind, you know, how I feel that I did very well. And in my first or second year of doing this, I, um, one of my clients was someone who was one of the original uh, people who started Comedy Central. And oh, wow. Had, yeah. And she had, um, she was very young and we were both very young. And I was trying to help her sell an apartment. And she was telling me about how she thought like the Wall Street Journal used to sell subscriptions by um, having people um, call up to get their guide to money and markets, which is an educational piece. Yeah. And she said, you know, I see that you're doing because I started a newsletter also my very first year, which I'll tell you about in a minute. But I, um, you know, here's this guide to money and markets, and that's how people are doing subscriptions. So I thought, you know, that's what I've been doing already, but let me just capitalize on that. So I continue to do things to educate people. And that's, I, I'm big in architectural history. So I'd send around architectural histories of people's buildings that they didn't know about. And it was, for me, great fun, because I love that kind of thing. So I, it's been part of my whole MO, and that's why my website is also so different, because that's just the way I operate. We should also mention, and I forgot to to mention this, Above the Fold too, which is also a, a very unique place for this, but is such a smart place position-wise on your website, on your homepage, is your your newsletter, which is right there. It, obviously, it's in fact, your spring 2022 newsletter is up. Uh, people can check it out. And you put this together yourself. And I, yeah. I just think this is part of what you just mentioned, this education, this providing value. Um, and, and tell us a little bit about how important is that newsletter to your overall branding strategy, marketing, or just keeping your clients sort of abreast of what's going on? I think it's critically important for me 
because my brand, and it was always this way, was to be sort of someone who was, as you, as you said in your intro, intellectual, you know, understanding and um, capable of really dealing with people on that kind of a level. So for me, that was a critical thing. And um, I actually started a newsletter when I first got into the business. Now, it did help that I had been in, when I was in the classical music business, I was in public relations. So I had learned how to write. I learned how to promote people. And um, I learned that type of writing. But um, I decided that there was validity back in the early days in me, and nobody was sending around newsletters back then, so I was very lucky. Um, in me, I was new. What did I know about the real estate market? But you know what I had? I had my observations. Yeah. And my observations were valid. And I decided that was very important. And so I wrote a letter with Dear, and I had the people, the names put in, and I talked about what I was observing in the market. Because back then there weren't, there wasn't websites and data. Right, you couldn't easily yeah. just pulse data and no, stats. Yeah. No, so people really enjoyed seeing and hearing. And the most important thing that I did is be hundred percent consistent. I was extremely consistent about it. So I would do it, you know, in that time period, four times a year because it was just a letter. It was simple. It wasn't so long. And then as time went on, it got more comprehensive, more complex. And instead of taking, well, this is me, instead of taking the company newsletter and using it where, you know, they get it from everybody, it really is specifically mine. And people do recognize that, which I find very interesting. They'll, they'll call me up and they'll say, you know, I've gotten your newsletter for years. It's so well done. It's so, you know, thoughtful or whatever they say. And they hold on to them because they're on beautiful paper. You don't have it. But I make sure they're on very nice paper. They're, they're really in my in my mind, they're one of my you know prize marketing tools. But that's not only that; it also is an educational tool. So, and I do not only that generalized newsletter, but I do newsletters on specific areas in Manhattan because I have a special specialization in those areas. So I work on those areas as well, provide data, and it's my own interpretation. It's not anybody else's. So, well, that um, that's what I that's what I love about about what you've done, and I think so many agents today are either not confident enough to put their observations into a newsletter. It's a heck of a lot easier to buy that information from a source that might write it all for you or might provide data that you just, you know, are, you know, sort of spit back out, regurgitate, which is fine. And, and I, I have no, no issues with that. Um, but it's more uncommon for me to see a content from a realtor with an actual point of view. And that is really what most people want to see. They, they want to know what you think versus maybe just here are the stats of the neighborhood. Um, so I think that's a really important distinction is putting your own observation. And it sounds like that was very successful for you. Well, well, it has been, and and frankly, um, I'm not sure if the company would allow everybody to do that. But I've been doing right. it for so many years, to be honest with you. And they're very, you know, they know that I know what I'm doing. So I'm fortunate in that way because I have the, their permission. I don't even have. I don't run. A, I shouldn't say I don't run it by the company, but they see it. They're aware of it, sure. and um, you know, um, and I and I feel really very proud of it, frankly. And I think it's a, a great tool. Not. I mean, I actually enjoy, even though it's a lot of work. Talk about podcasting, a lot of work. These newsletters are a lot of work, um, but oh, I have yeah. a wonderful team. I have to just tell you, I've developed, and we can talk about that if, you, if you'd like. Sure. I've developed this team, <clears throat> and right now I have one of the best teams I've ever had. I really just love everyone on my team. I mean, they're just fabulous. They're experienced. The, the oldest member in terms of the years working with me on the team is someone who's been with me 24 years. Wow. And I have, on average, the agents on my team I just recently hired three young, because I have to have, you know, young people on my team, and, and their average time in, in, in the business is about two years, but my other team members, the agents, their, their average time is about nine years or 10 years. Wow. So I have really experienced agents on my team. They're all superb. I would have them handle my properties. They're excellent. And I feel very confident in them and I just adore them. I adore them as people and um, I just think they're excellent at what they do. So anyway, it's just, it's wonderful. And all the agents are all women, as you say, so in celebration of this particular month, but um, it's great. And, and I also, yeah, it, it is really cool. And your enthusiasm for wanting to help, not just help, but educate is clearly coming through. Even, yeah. even in this conversation, you're educating our audience on your process. And I appreciate uh, that. And before, I, I have to ask you only because you're a classically trained musician. Do you have a favorite composer? Oh my goodness. 
that, that's a really hard thing to have. <laughs> it's like, what, it, it is. Do you have some I favorite to, composers? <laughs> yeah, you know, oddly, oddly, and I don't know, that's a sad thing to say, but I do really love some of the Russian, you know, I, I love some of the Russian sure. composers, you know, um, sure. Stravinsky. And I just think that they're at Prokofiev. I love some of that beautiful, very sort of haunting music. I'm sad yeah. to see what's going on right now. Yeah, but, um, yeah. But I, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, I was a bassoonist, so the most famous bassoon concerto is, is a Mozart bassoon concerto. So I obviously, who doesn't love Mozart, you know? He's, um, yeah, I, yeah, I've yet to find, I, I'm not that, I, I've been playing um, guitar my whole life and I played classical guitar um, for, for a bit, um, which is a whole different style of playing and very, very difficult compared to like rock and roll style guitar. But um, but yeah, Mozart is, is, and I haven't listened to every, uh, you know, classical composer, but Mozart to me is, I'm, I'm con consistently amazed. I just recently got into, he has a, a five violin concerto um, uh, set and I, I was listening to it going, this is some of the most incredible music I'd ever yeah. heard. So uh, anyway, yeah, we, we, everyone loves Mozart. But I would love to see on your website you playing some bassoon. That well, would be, I uh, you know, I, I had my instrument stolen and, and I just recently, oh no. Are, no, I'm not kidding, some many years ago. Who steals a bassoon? I don't, know, don't ask, it was way back. <laughs> anyway, um, recently I joined a group of uh, business people who were classical musicians in their former lifetimes. and. Um, actually, somebody just recently lent me their bassoon, and I just bought a reed recently. So I nice. am about to try it for the first time, and I can't hate to tell you a few decades. Yeah. So we'll yeah. see how it goes. <laughs> how 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 exciting! Um, yeah. I yeah. want to talk about staging, and and yeah. I we, we this is something we've talked about it uh, before on the show over the years. Yes. But I think, and I have a theory, and I, and I want you to tell me if I'm <laughs> if it's an accurate theory or if I'm wildly inaccurate because I'm not a producing agent. I don't go out there. I sit at a desk all day. So I don't know what you guys know, but I would assume as somebody who's kind of more on the other side, oddly enough, uh, even though I recruit realtors all day long, I really know so little about, about the industry. Um, but, um, which is even more funny that I do this show, but it is a lot of fun. However, um, I would think from somebody who still sees himself as a bit of an outsider, um, the idea that we're living in an Instagram perfect world, um, as well as, you know, with everyone having immediate access to making their faces look perfect with a tap of a thing and reducing, you know, make reducing blemishes and things. And we all can look young and beautiful and, and we can make every thing we eat look beautiful and amazing. Um, how important is staging today maybe even due to the fact that we're so used to seeing perfect imagery online all day long it was through an infinite scroll. Well, I mean, I, I'm, you know, for better or for worse, <laughs> staging is really, I think, critical to achieving the strongest possible price. But I believe that 20 years ago when I was the first agent in the um, New York area to stage. Um, so I, I was really, I saw, I knew it was happening in California. Maybe it was happening in other places, but I knew it was happening in California. And I had an apartment, I'll never forget it. Um, it was a, it was on Central Park West and it was a small three bedroom. And the woman had her mother, moved her mother in with her. So we painted it, emptied it, made it nice and clean and started showing it. And one of the bedrooms was small. And there was no dining room. So people would come in and complain. And I, I remember it was priced at 1.595. And this goes back 20 years ago, okay? And then um, we lowered it to 1.495. We kept getting 1.275. We couldn't get higher. And she desperately wanted 1.3. So I said, you know, there's this thing called staging. And I've been wanting to do it. And I think that would really help you get your 1.3. So I went out to the furniture rental company that I knew. And I said, I'm going to try this. You know, what is it going to cost? So for $10,000, I picked out all the furniture. I placed it. I got things from my house, brought it in. And then I put it back on the market. And what do you think I got? I, 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 I'm, I'm excited to hear how much. 1.5. From wow. two people. So with a ten thousand dollar investment, yes, essentially. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I never looked back after that. Another thing I could do to help people achieve the highest possible price. So I started doing it and I had a good eye for it. I still have a good eye for it. Um, and I think that's the key also to doing this successfully because I'm one of those people that some stagers don't like to work with because I'm very highly critical. Because you, um, you know what you're doing, yeah. I know what I want. The, the top stager in the city, one of the top stagers in the city who I work with, uh, it's IMG, if you know that name. They're really wonderful. And they, they're 
I'm one of, probably one of the only people to listen to when, when there are corrections to be made because I do have a right idea of what I want to see. I know exactly what I want to see. I know what works. I know what doesn't work. And uh, when a stager doesn't do a good job, I don't mind to say it because I know it, you know. So I'm, I'm pretty, pretty tough to work for. But if you do a good job, I'm easy. <laughs> well, are there any? Oh, a quick question about staging yeah. because um, actually I have a bunch of questions. Um, but the first one is around, are you still renting equipment or do you have your own product now that you store? And mm -hmm. Okay. You know, I, I just don't want to get into that business, even though I, I actually initially did. But I will tell you that you, your, your question, um, and I think it is a good business for some agents, and it's a great way to maybe do that. There's some people who are very successful with that. And I think if I was a little bit younger, maybe I would do it. But um, but it is it's a lot, lot of work, I think, to cart things around. <laughs> but I will tell you, you asked about Instagram and you asked about, um, you know, how, why it's important. Well, when I was doing it, I was the standout apartment because nobody else was doing it. But yeah. now everybody's doing it. And on Instagram, everybody's perfect, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if you don't have that, I mean, what can you do? You have to try and elevate beyond whatever it is, but, you, but these are such picture perfect images, right? That you, to compete, you have to be at least as good. So that's part of the problem. It's a, it's a dilemma um, because the reality is, th there's another thing about you know, beautifully staged apartments and also beautiful photographs because mm. sometimes, and, and I struggle with this, to be honest with you. I struggle with the fact that sometimes we do these gorgeous photographs and then the apartment's not as good as the photographs. And I think sometimes that's- a Yeah, and you have to think about that. Yes, and I sometimes don't, I'm not, you know, sometimes it's just these apartments are just, I don't know about houses, but sometimes the rooms with the angles, it's impossible yeah. to get a really good photo. And those are the ones that people come in and they're overwhelmed yeah. because they're so excited by it. Yeah. So it's, a, it's kind of one of those things. You want great photographs, but you don't want them too good. But on the other hand, they should be picture perfect because they have. You know that them. that's a really good point. I, I it's sort of I think about this. I, I'm not a single person, but if I were, um, and when I was single in in recent years, um, back uh, after these these tools became available for everyone to look young and beautiful and perfect, um, and then you'd meet some. You know, I'd go on a date and I'd meet a, a woman, and she didn't look as perfect as her photo because nobody does of course and and i and i would go boy psychologically i understand why people do it but psychologically for me that's a bit of a, a little tiny bit of a bummer like oh of course they used a filter okay this is what they really look like whereas um so you, you're dealing with a similar sort of thing in real estate it's like you want it to look beautiful and, and, and attractive but you also don't want somebody to go in and go oh okay this isn't exactly what i saw in the photos that was perfect lighting and, and you do see this it's so funny um, we see it with, I love when um, some of the virtual staging that happens and they make the sky just a little bit too perfect if it's an yeah. exterior shot or the lawn, if it's, you know, if there's grass, it's like a little too green. And you're like, well, I know it doesn't really look like that. And so I always think, boy, they just crank the, uh, the contra or the, the vibrancy up on, on yeah. these colors. And so I imagine there is an art to it, a little bit of a push and pull of make yeah. it look look realistic but also beautiful but not too beautiful so yeah um, we, we can drive some of those virtual stages crazy to be honest with you <laughs> i'm sure <laughs> but i'd rather do that than have something that's not quite right you know <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's true and and when you're dealing with listings what percentage of the time do you uh provide staging is it every single listing is it so, just certain listings i would say about 90 percent of the time and wow. yeah but not um it's not always full staging Sometimes sure. it's just a matter of tweaking. I mean, I just, I, I had an apartment and, you know, her apartment was dated. She wasn't going to do a whole staging, but we went in there, we brought lights. I mean, we, I will do what we call sort of minimal staging. I have a, two staging closets. Okay. That's my inventory. And I have a lot of my inventory out right now. And so I, you know, I'll take things in and I'll make it, I'll, 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 I'll just, uh, it up, make it a little bit more, you know, nicer. Put some, put some orchids in there, some beautiful fake orchids that are nicely done. Um, I'll put some color. I've got tons of pillows, so many pillows. I mean, I could do a pillow warehouse, um, and I've got you know accessories and so forth. You know, beautiful vases. You know, that kind of thing. So you know, because people don't always live that way, right? Right. Um, I have artwork. I've got mirrors. So I'll bring in things to really help. And honestly, I think it makes a difference. I don't want to say it makes a full difference, but does it help me just 
elevate the property? Yeah. And that's, again, something that I feel is a real wonderful service. And I do, I mean, if I don't, since I have a team, I have a lot of people doing a lot for me. But when it comes to staging, especially some of the apartments that are, you know, a certain price point, I, I'm there, you know, because I'm the one in the, everybody knows on my team that I am the perfectionist or the one who really has the best eye for staging. Well, and so, it's your brand too. So yeah. you want it to aesthetically, you know, uh, fit a certain design style. And, yeah. um, but it is interesting that now uh, staging has become so much more popular because we now stage all of our photos for our entire lives. You know, you, you know. scroll through and, right. and <laughs> I've, I've been seen a wrinkle on someone's face in like 10 years now. <laughs> and I'm like, boy, my friends must all uh, be just aging so gracefully. Uh, I know. But, it's uh it's but it, it's so easy and it's and, and it and it's but it is important because we we do expect and i, I think now also with technology uh making th our gratification so much faster we're able right. to get things delivered instantly whether it's you know everything from food to you know anything you want to purchase you can basically buy within a day or so it'll be at your doorstep um we're, we're used to jumping you know in in cabs and ubers and just not even having to say where we're going they just know because I we know. told the app <laughs> uh, we we've just we don't have to do much anymore and i think even though the diy community has has been growing um i think that's a certain type of, of the popular, a certain percentage of the population. And then there's another percentage that's like, why isn't it perfect now? And so it's, so the staging I think is really important. Um, and I've seen, yeah, I've seen it in our own agents. Uh, we encourage everyone to do it. Um, but if, if you do have clients that resist that, um, you know, how do you sort of handle that, you know, who maybe they have an emotional attachment to particular pieces of furniture or um, how do you address that? Well, I have such confidence in what I do, that I, I'm very firm with people. And if I rarely get turned down when it's about furniture and things like that, but occasionally I do. Just recently, I had a listing where they had had this, a lot of turquoises and blues, which can be good in a mid-century modern kind of setting, but it was a little bit off. It was not right. And I, I they would not stage. And, and their neighbor who had referred me, and I was the third broker on it, because it didn't sell uh, with the right. blues and the color and this and that. They had vacated it because they bought another place. Um, and I finally said, okay, if you're not going to do that, you must paint it. And I'll give you the white because you, you have no idea. I know every white that's out there. So I know what's going to be the best white in what apartment. And I take the color swatches in. And I really do this every time. And I, and I make sure that it's the best it'll provide. In this case, it was a light deprived apartment. How's that? And um, I wanted to make sure it had the highest light reflection. I got through light fixtures. I did all sorts of things. And we made it a beautiful clean slate. I mean, a beautiful clean slate. And we sold it right away. So, you know, I, I just, you know, we do the best we can. I mean, I couldn't stage it, but obviously whatever I did, did, did the right thing. So... You know, awesome. <laughs> yeah. I, and I, I love that. I would love to hear your philosophy on building a real estate business as well. I know oh that's something that you're passionate about. I am. I am. I mean, I started out, look, the world's a lot different than when I started. And so a lot of the things that I did, but it's the same principles anyway, um, had to do with, you know, high, my big thing was about um, incredible customer service as you can tell, educating and incredible customer service because um, I was determined that I would stand out. I, I always felt that I, I'm kind of a perfectionist. I've, I've kind of dropped a lot of the perfectionism to being, you know, like 90% 90, 90 is good enough or 95% is good enough. Um, but I, you know, I really um, wanted to be treating people the way that I would want to be treated because, you know, even if you're buying a 500 th in, in New York, what was a $500,000 apartment is not a lot of money relative to other apartments, but it's still $500,000. So you want to be treated in a certain way. It's a lot of money. And I never lose sight of that fact. And so one of the things we do is high level of customer service. The marketing for me, as you've heard already, what I do in terms of the newsletters. And of course, I was doing... Um, event at the time that COVID kind of curtailed it. I did a lot of events. I used to do classical music concerts. I had Steinway come. I did all sorts, I did things with the landmarks organizations. I'm very interested, as you can tell, in architectural history. I did all sorts of things to, you know, really distinguish myself. Um, when I was a little behind the times, although I'm not that far behind the times in terms of Instagram and Facebook, just because 
you know, it was just so new to me and I just wasn't quite, I was caught a little off guard, but I think we've caught up. We have a great following and we have to do a great, we try, and we've been trying to improve it and improve it because we know, again, we want to educate people. We want to provide this beautiful content visually. But um, again, I'm, I'm really more into educating. But I think if you stay consistent with marketing, which is part of what I've done, and you stay consistent with staying in touch with people, which is the other thing, um, I have a whole system. I have a, a, a what we call in my in my team a deal management system, which I might end up selling at one point to people. But it's a wonderful way. It's different because it's specifically meant for the real estate industry, and I find it really helpful. In I do a weekly meeting in my team, and we go over every buyer, every seller, so we know everything that's going on, and we go over every single lead that we have. And we are constantly on top of the people that we have that are long or short-term leads. So we're constantly doing things to think about future business and building business. And I, and, and obviously it's, it's proven results, you know? Yeah, yes, uh, clearly. I'm curious on staying in touch. I always feel yeah. that that is oftentimes an agent's Achilles heel, especially after a sale, but, but of course, pre-sale as well. Um, I once asked, <clears throat> Excuse me. I once asked a one of the top agents here in Chicago who was on our our show, um, and she is like, like when I say top out of forty six thousand agents, she's like number two or three. And I asked her. I said, "Well, what do you think the difference is between you?" And she was just this very polite, sweet, uh, soft spoken kind of kind of person. And I um, was trying to extract what her sort of you know sort of secret was of success. And she goes, you know, um, I'm not smarter than anyone else, but I do call every one of my clients every single week. And I said, you know, regardless of whether there's an update or not. And I said, and, and she goes, no, that, that, that's it. <laughs> and, um, wow. so, and, and of course she does a million other things too, but, um, but I'm curious on, on, because you, you talk about consistency with your branding, with your marketing, but also with your communication, you know, one-to-one -one communication. Um, how does your team do that? W what are you doing? You talked about having a meeting each week where you're going over all of the team's leads and kind of where everyone is in the process. Um, but, but can you go a little bit deeper on that and just share, well, you know, specifically? I mean, well, how you well we do. We have, we have a meeting and then I have each of my team members is responsible for a certain number of leads. Um, and, and what they have to do is stay in touch with them, not as a crazy person, because we're already touching base with them with all our newsletters and all our information. But um, we go through periods and we've just gone through the period beginning of seasons where we want to know if people are maybe interested in selling. So what we'll do is we'll... Um, I, I don't like to send a very simple thing. I don't want to send, oh, how are you doing? You know, the market's good, blah, 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 blah. I want to give whoever I send a note to something that's relevant to them, okay? Right. Again, it's about educating. So I want to let them know this apartment's been sold. These three apartments have sold in your neighborhood. That's great for you. It shows that your value is 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 strong right now um and then i'll give a little blurb about the market and you know as it relates to them because in new york i don't know how it is in chicago but in new york we have all these different market segments i'm guessing you have the same there sure so it's very specific what's going on in whatever the segment is so i i make a very specific you know paragraph about what's going on in their market and i, I tell you we get a great response rate and I do it on a regular basis. And we've just gone through a round of them and I'm still working through them because I have my team members write them based on what I, you know, have just said to you. And then I edit them and make sure that they're, you know, they're right. Because I, I actually usually know the people that are the, the leads. I know the sellers or the buyers, whoever it is. And, um, you know, it's, it's proven to be a really good, because people know that they're carefully specifically written they're not a form letter that's why it's hard for me to take some of those like um you know uh management systems sort of they cut the contact management systems which for, just spit out a you know a form letter type of a thing yeah. for me it's tough because i like this personal touch just like the woman who calls i just don't have time to call everybody but sure. i do it through letters you know so yeah it, you know it's really funny i was thinking about this the other day i i purchased a place um, my primary residence um 
in, it was a new development. And just for, it's so funny that I, I should have gone to the MLS because I am technically a real estate agent, even though I don't use my license. So I should have gone straight to the MLS to run a, a, a comp for myself, but because I'm lazy, I went just like most people straight to Zillow. And I'm like, I wonder what Zillow thinks my home after a year of purchasing, not that I'm thinking of moving, I am not. Uh, but I was like, you know, everyone likes to know what their home is worth. And this really speaks to what, what you were talking about. So I went on to Zillow and I typed in my address. And now I don't know how accurate the Zestimate was, but it was a very nice number to see um, mm -hmm. because I just happened to sort of accidentally time the market well, just because of, you know, the pandemic was, was so strange, but just kind of got lucky that way. And so I went, oh my God, look at what my place is worth. Now, I don't know if that number is accurate, but I started thinking, you know, I've lived here a year. I Obviously, I think realtors who even know about this development might think, oh, they're, nobody's moved in is moving out anytime soon. And they're, you know, they're all new and they just spent a bunch of money on these on these places. Um, but I have there's 46,000 realtors in, in the Chicagoland area. I have not received one postcard and maybe they know I'm in the business, but I doubt it. Um, uh, not one postcard, not, Hey, we noticed your home has actually appreciated since you purchased yeah. it. Yeah. Um, and, and these are not, um, you know, starter, uh, condos. These are, these are more, you know, um, expensive type condos. And, and so I, I'm just thinking, gosh, there's so much opportunity for agents to do exactly what you're talking about is to send that. I mean, I had to look it up myself and, right. um, and, and then I ran a real comp and I went, okay, this estimate was, wasn't totally accurate, but it was still like a nice thing to know because everyone likes to know what their place is worth. Sure. Sure. And, um, and, and it's, it's such a simple thing that you do, but it isn't, uh, it, it isn't easy to do. It's simple, yeah. but it is incredibly important to those homeowners. Yeah, it is. I mean, it's again, educating, it's again, imparting information. It's all in, in the same vein of everything that I do. And so it fits and I, you know, and I like it. I just, I like it. I feel like I add value. And I think by feeling I mean, I think other people feel like I do as well. Otherwise, I wouldn't get the business I get. <laughs> yeah. So, and I do. I really try to help people out. It's it's just been my philosophy because the way I see it, I'm very blessed. I really feel like I've had a great run, a great life. And, you know, the, my business has been fab, you know, really excellent. So, you know, if I don't sell something, I don't sell something. But I'd rather help that person. And that's how I've always felt. That's how I always started the business because I felt that people would understand that and feel that in their hearts. That's how I felt. And, and I felt that way anyway. But, you know, you're sort of sometimes tempted because maybe times are a little tough and you want to, you know, that's just not a good way to be because people feel the anxiety or they feel whatever it is. And I sometimes say to my agents, I have one agent who came to me recently. She was losing a deal. And I said, you, okay, you got to calm down. <laughs> I said, you got to calm down because you can't want this more than them. You have to want what's best for them. And if they don't want it, you have to accept it. You just have to accept it. You have to let it go and accept it. And I want you to get, and I had a coach her to be very accepting. I told her what to say. I said, you have to put yourself in this frame of mind. Well, wouldn't you know it? The first, the deal fell apart and then it came back together. Amazing. So, you got to let these things go. I mean, it's really about the other person. It's not about you, you know, it's about yeah. the other person. Well, so, I, have I have two final questions okay. for you because, and I know, I know just how busy, well, I don't know how busy you are. I suspect, <laughs> I know how busy I suspect you are uh, managing a major team as one of the top teams in all of Manhattan. Um, but I do have two, two important questions that I think our audience, one's a fun one and one's a, a, a more serious one. We'll start with the more serious one, which okay. is you've been in this business a long time, 36 years, you've had a tremendous amount of success. I would love to hear your take on what's going on in the market today. Um, just to sort of set the, the, a simple stage in New York is certainly Manhattan is its its own thing, of course, uh, right. as well as San Francisco and a few other our markets kind of similarly. But I know here in Chicago, um, w which is a, a different market, but probably maybe more common to other major cities, um, you know, we're dealing with a lot of shortages uh, in inventory, you know, obviously low, in low interest rate environments. So tons of people are buying with more purchasing power than they had before. Um, I'm sure that helps out in New York as well when everything is so incredibly expensive expensive to begin with. Um, but but what, what do you think the state of the market is and where do you sort of see it going? Right. Well, um, you know, we were hit the worst, I think, of all yeah. markets during the pandemic because we were the epicenter for the pandemic when it happened. Yeah. So it was a real, um, it was just a struggle. 
anyway, um, and we came out of it, and I like to say the bottom of the market was sometime between August and October of 2020. But then it started going up from there. So, um, and we had a record year last year in terms of volume, in terms of sales volume. What didn't, uh, it did not translate into, the prices did come back to pre-pandemic prices, but we're still not at the peak as we were in the 2000 sort of 14 to 16 time period, really 14, 15 time period. Um, I will say that um, there were some exceptions to that. Um, the market in general has been very, very strong in the new development condo world, which is they're having record years and their prices are up relative to other properties. Um, and so that's sort of where they are. Now what's happened this year as we're going into 2022 is that we have, um, we're not having a lot of inventory come on the market. So this is the first time we're having that. So we are seeing a little bit, and I'm seeing a little bit of upper pressure on resales. A new development, you know, you can't, you can't keep a decent new development on the market right now. Um, but in terms of resales, which are resale condos, resale co-ops, those were having, um, you know, we have a, sh a shortage in certain categories, like that one that I told you we sold right away, the classic sixes. There's certain categories where they're sitting on the market, so it's a little uneven, depending on location, size, price point. But what is pretty uniform is that we don't have a lot of inventory coming on the market like we normally do at this time of year. So the lack of inventory may result in price increases. Now we are in a time period where we're looking at very volatile stock market for, for obvious yep. reasons because of mm -hmm. Russia and Ukraine. And that is a very yep. incredibly sad thing that's going on right now. And we don't know exactly how, you know, obviously whatever happens there is going to have an impact on our market to some degree, but people still, are, we do have a shortage of inventory now relative to before. And so we are starting, we're seeing people just make decisions when new things come on the market. And so it's still a robust market. It's still very strong. It's sort of like last year, which was very strong. Um, but I think there's a little cloud because of the Russia Ukraine thing and the volatility of the markets. Yeah, no, I think that's, tiny I think that's no, no, it makes, it, it makes sense. Um, I think, I think that's, that's right. I know pre pan or right when the pandemic started, we're, we're friendly with some um, brokerage owners in, in Manhattan and they were really concerned about, you know, people fleeing the city and whether they'd come back and what the office buildings would, would be pop, how, how populated they would be when we return to normal. And we're starting to get there, which is, which is exciting. Um, but um, it's good to know that Manhattan is is uh, is still doing doing well. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I imagine too. But it is funny too because then you you end up realtors. It, it, most of our listeners, I think, as well as just realtors in the country, oftentimes had uh, their best year last year, which is sort of a weird sort of uh, benefit to this awful sort of tragedy right. that we've all gone through. Um, but. It's also driven prices up and, and there's been, you know, just uh, some inventory shortages. Um, but I imagine for you a great opportunity to reach out to your your owners and say, hey, you know, if you're looking to, uh, you know, now we've a lot of us have learned and, and maybe real estate agents uh, don't get to benefit as much from this. But a lot of just traditional businesses now are like, hey, work wherever you want. Um, you know, yeah. do do things. So, you know, I, I, I met people traveling. Uh, I traveled a bit in the last several years um, when it was safe to do so all over uh, various countries. And I was shocked at how many people who, you know, just said, you know, I subletted my place or I'm renting out my condo and I'm traveling right now and I'm not totally sure where I want to, to end up. Um, so this idea that um, people who own now, maybe some of those shackles of, that immediate geographic location where they thought, like I thought I was gonna to have to be in Chicago my whole life and I love the city. However, now I know I could probably, since I'm not, you know, a realtors again have a, a bit of a, a, a bigger mountain to climb if they wanna sort of work remotely, I think that's harder. But, um, but a lot of business people now can just kind of go everywhere. So are you seeing a lot of, a lot of opportunities there to, to say to your, your people who have purchased in the past, hey, what are your plans? What, what are you thinking of doing? You mean in terms of selling and just in terms of, 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 yeah, now, now people can say, you know, they're, they're able to say, well, gosh, maybe I want to move to Nashville or, or Austin or Charleston or some of these, yeah. these places where now, you know, it, people can move. I imagine that probably has opened up conversations between yeah. you and your clients. Yeah, a lot that we, we have a little bit of migration to Florida and some of the Southern sure. states. Um, and um, 
so that is happening but you know there's those of us who live in manhattan and love manhattan yeah um no and this is a large portion of the population um there's no place like manhattan no so place. one of the things that um is happening and this countering a little bit of this sort of some people moving out and doing remote work elsewhere is the fact that people want a piece of Manhattan. So we're getting a lot yeah. of people are getting a pied de terre, a second home or a third home or a fourth home, whatever it is. Um, and that is driving a lot of a certain portion of the market, which is nice. So people really want to have a piece. They want to have a home here. And we're seeing more of that. I don't know, I don't know if there are any percentages, but, it, but again, anecdotally, and unlike any other agent, right? We're getting a fair share of people like that. And uh, more than I would say most, but um, so I think that percentage is up actually, which is nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I've always thought, which I probably will never be able to afford to do myself, although who knows, but um, I, if I were to get a second place, uh, I, I would, it would be in Manhattan. If, oh, if, the, if it, <laughs> again, that's, that's a, it's a huge, uh, huge uh, accomplishment if I were able to be able to do that. But, um, but yeah, my, my growing up, my mom used to say just, just to kind of uh, say something cute. Um, although I don't certainly don't mean to offend anyone else because I do not have any ego about where I live and, and uh, about any, I've, I've been to almost every state in this country and I, I really yeah. like all of them uh, to some degree. But um, uh, my mom used to say, there's really three cities. <laughs> Growing up, she'd go, it's New York, number one, Chicago's number two, and San Francisco's number three. And she's like, that's it. And I always thought that was kind of funny. Um, but um, but but there there is something very magical about, about New York and people who live there, you know, want to, you know, yeah, maybe they end up retiring to Florida. But like my, my sister now, who now lives in Florida, she's not retired. Um, they're raising uh, their, their son there. And it makes more sense for them to do that, but they are itching to get back. So uh, right, right. I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited to hear that, that New York right. is, is still going so strong. Yeah, it is. And it's not just Manhattan, by the way, Brooklyn has fared oh, remarkably well, better than Manhattan. Yep. <laughs> It's been yeah. incredible. <laughs> so I, I remember, I, I remember like Brooklyn when, when, um, when it wasn't, it was, it wasn't so much fun to go to Brooklyn, <laughs> and uh, and now it's just, uh, it's just like, whoa, this is the, this is the coolest part. I'm uh, telling you, know. you the, Bro the Brooklyn agents last year they hit it out of the park. Honestly, oh. it was crazy. So Manhattanites, which I am one, um, my my daughter, she had her choice, might live in Brooklyn, but she's now living in the village, but. Anyway, um, so, you know, Manhattan, Manhattanites are sort of Manhattanites, but Brooklyn has been really like one of the hottest locations in the New York City area. So and cool. it has, it continues to be, so. Yeah, you know. I, it's fun. Brooklyn, oh, so I, I just, I, I haven't, since my sister moved to Florida about five, five years ago, we, we used to spend all of our uh, holidays um, in, in Manhattan because my sister lived there and why not? And um, now, now we're down in Florida, which of course, weather-wise is nice, but, um, but we don't get to go to, to uh, Manhattan as much. And uh, oh, uh, well, New come York, visit. I, I, I'm come going visit. to, and I'll, I, take, I, I'll I, show you some of my favorite restaurants and things. I, I would love that. Or we could just go to John's and, uh, in, oh, yeah, the, in the village yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. <laughs> it's a pizza uh, yeah it. well um I, I do have one one and i never i you know it's funny just to pull back the curtain on how we we do these um uh, set up these interviews with with people like diana we we i have somebody on my team her name's zana and she does a pre-interview and sends questions and diana wrote a really really we ask these questions and then i never end up asking the uh, asking them during the interview and i always feel bad because uh. our guests write out these really long wonderful answers but i'm going to ask you this one because I thought this was such a great answer. Um, we, we usually ask people, what's your like funniest real estate experience? And yours was a real comedy of errors here. It's like, it, it's almost, if you were to write it into a script, it would, it, you'd get notes back from the, from the uh, producers going, this isn't realistic. This isn't going to happen. So we can't put this, it, it's not, no one's going to assume that this could ever happen, but it did happen. <laughs> and so they say what reality is stranger than fiction, but could you mind sharing that sort of that your brownstone right. inspection experience? <laughs> So, you know, in New York City, we have these row houses. We call them brownstones, townhouses. There, there are many different names that are used for them. This was a brownstone, which is made out of brownstone. And it's a house. But, and originally it was a single family house, but they get divided up into apartments. And this was a while ago. Um, but I, 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 I had sold two floors, the lower two floors of this house. And so you, um, and, and, and we were bringing an inspector in. And this is the comedy of errors that happened. So we walk into the house with the inspector. 
And, um, you know, with inspections in New York don't happen, will happen before the contract is signed. I don't know, it's different than outside of the city, but we had just done the thing. And, but it'd been, a, but I hadn't been in the house in a, in a little bit, in like a week or two, because it takes a little time for some of the due diligence to take place. We go into the house with the inspector and I open the door and the alarm goes off. So I, now this was the first thing that happened. And, and you did not know there was an alarm or how to turn it off. I didn't have the code for whatever reason, okay. they hadn't set the alarm before. And I tried calling them and they didn't answer their phone. And I was going crazy because I think the police are going to come. The fire department's going to come. I don't know what's going to happen. And I finally, out of desperation, I, I go walking up the stairs to the apartment upstairs and I knock on the door and, and this man opens this opens the door in a bathroom. And I'm thinking, oh my God, it was the middle of the day, right? And I thought, oh dear, I'm so sorry, but I set off the alarm and I, I, I can't reach them. And do you happen to have the code to the alarm? He said, no, 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 I um, was just out of surgery. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm so sorry. And I went running back. I didn't mean to disturb you. And I'm sorry about the alarm. And I went running back downstairs. And I'm meanwhile trying to figure out this alarm and, and they're going around and they're doing their inspection. And then they go ahead and they open the flue and they're testing the fireplace. And he puts the uh, fireplace on and lo and behold, you know, he opened the flu, he knew what he was doing. Smoke comes, bill here's the alarm going off, smoke comes billowing in this apartment, and I'm like, oh my God, the people call and they finally give me the alarm code, I turn it off, and I'm like, I can't even tell them about this smoke, I don't even know what to say. Right, but we're not even gonna mention the smoke. Around. <laughs> I, don't know I, don't even, I didn't know what to do. And I'm like, and finally we get the fire calmed down, this window's open, everything's, everything's you know, complete and done. And finally I said, I'm like, get through this inspection. It was, you know, 2,500 square feet of space with all sorts of things, you know, outdoor area, back of the apartment house, the long inspection. So finally, we're finally finished. We close everything up. We go out and now in these buildings, you know, there's the front door to the apartment and we go out the front door of the apartment and then we have to go and pull the front door um, forward. That's how they work. You pull, you take the knob and you pull it in. And I go to take the knob and pull it in and the doorknob falls off in my hand. Of course <laughs> it does. I cannot get out of this house and I can't make this up. This was just the killer. <laughs> I just I said, okay, what do we do now? <laughs> It was Amazing. A I had it. <laughs> that is incredible. So <laughs> well, maybe maybe all the bad luck just happened at once and then yeah. you didn't have hopefully any more bad luck that that year. <laughs> but what a what a great story. And I think our, our audience can can certainly relate to oh. every every agent and has had, you know, those types of experiences. Yeah, this, is, this is crazy. <laughs> I ended yeah. up I ended up sending flowers to the guy with the um, who had the surgery. I felt so bad. I ended up selling three of three of the four apartments in that building ultimately. So it didn't turn out so badly. <laughs> oh wow, amazing. Well, Deanna, I so appreciate you coming on our show and sharing your your truth about how you built your business, um, suggestions for agents of what they can do with respect to branding and marketing, um, talking about your process and your team's process. It's been incredibly valuable. Um, I want everyone who is listening to please check out Deanna's uh, team's website, which is the Deanna Corey team, part of the Corcoran Group. Um, visit Deanna on her website, which is DeannaCorey.com. And again, it's really a cool and different way to present your uh, her or Deanna in particular and her team present themselves with putting really great content front and center versus you know below the fold and you have to scroll to find it and also check out her newsletter as well but her website is deannacory.com and I'll spell that d e a n n a uh, K-O-R-Y.com. And I was telling Deanna ahead of time that I grew up with a lot of Corys who were Lebanese. So I keep wanting to misspell uh, Cory because I'm used to it being spelled a different way. But D-E-A-N-N-A-K-O-R-Y.com is the uh, Deanna Corey team website. Also, there's a link to that in our show notes. Um, and Deanna, it has been an absolute pleasure. Oh, by the way, all of her social media is also um, uh, accessed right from her website, but also check her out on Instagram, which is the 
uh, which is Deanna Corey Teen. Um, we'll also have a link to that in our show notes. And she has great social media. Um, so please check her out there. And if you happen to be a buyer, a seller, an investor, a renter, um, and you are looking in the you know New York City area and you would like to work with one of the top teams there, Deanna, what's um what's the best way somebody may uh, could reach out to you? Obviously email or text and um, we'll get right back to you. <laughs> and we have great, <laughs> as I said to you, agents who are very experienced. On average, they're uh, like seven or 10 years in the business, depending. So I have fabulous people that I would have work with me if I was a, a newcomer or an experienced purchaser. So anytime would be happy to help. Yeah. And so just send an email to info at deannacorey.com or visit their website, deannacorey.com. You can get in touch with them. They're all their information's right front and center. It's super easy. She's easy to find. Yeah. Um, and she's everywhere. So it's a, it's really a very, very, very present a realtor in New York. On behalf of our audience, uh, Deanna, thank you so much for your time today. This was a thank real you. pleasure for us. Um, it was a real, uh, I, I definitely want to see um, the, the first bassoon uh, uh sort of practice with your new read and your borrowed instrument by the way not a lot of bassoons floating around out there so i oh. i love that it's not not an easy instrument to find uh so i i can appreciate uh appreciate you getting back into that which i think is really really fun and i i suspect your um your your contacts and, and your your clients will love to see uh you participating in that if you decide to keep going with it um because of course that's your part of your background um yeah. but also on behalf of deanna and myself we want to thank our listeners and our viewers for continuing to support our show for making it all the way to the end of the episode we uh -huh. ask everyone before they sign off to do just two quick things well three things visit the deannacorey.com check out what what her and her team are all about uh, also give you some great ideas for your own business but also um two other things is please tell a friend about this episode think of one other agent that could benefit from hearing this wonderful conversation and insight from deanna 36 years in the business uh, billions of, of dollars of real estate sold send them a link to this uh this episode you can or just send them to our website which is keeping it real pod.com every episode we've ever done can be streamed right there or if they're a podcast person just pull up a podcast app have them search for keeping it real and hit that subscribe button and I know this is a long uh, exit, so I apologize. But one last thing, please leave us a review. Whatever app you might be listening to this show on, whether it's Apple Podcasts or Google Play or Stitcher, Spotify, whatever, Pandora, Amazon, wherever you're listening to this, let us know what you think of the show. Tell us, uh, give us a star review, um, hopefully more than one star, but give us whatever you think is right, because that helps us um, continue to improve. And we want to, we, we make the show for you. So let us know what we can do to get better. Uh, and um, that just helps us uh, reach more people as well. So Deanna, on behalf of everyone, thank you so much for coming on our show. And we are so excited uh, to continue to watch your team, uh, you know, take over Manhattan. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me.